and Jenny Kimball. And we're very excited to have him, both of them here today. It's really awesome. This is our first uh, kickoff of our little talks or presentations that we plan to do in the future. So what I'd like you guys to do is just kind of tell the group a little bit about yourself and then um, we'll get started. Okay. Okay. Uh, I am originally from Michigan and I have been in Santa Fe about 20 years. My father worked for General Motors and spent a lot of time at the Arizona Proving Grounds and so was in the Southwest a lot. My mom is a jeweler and so when my dad came out to do the trips in the Arizona Proving Grounds, um, my mom would go to Navajo and Hopi and Zuni and she did a lot of trading. Uh, when I was 11, so this will tell you a lot about my age, when I was 11, my father, the engineer, decided that um, the family needed to spend the bicentennial in the country's oldest capital. So I have photos of myself standing in the plaza in at La Fonda, July 4th, 1976. Oh, cool. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. And then how did you um, get started here in Santa Fe? Oh, I followed a love who it turns out wasn't my true love, but he's still cute. <laughs> um, and I actually have, uh, I graduated from the University of Michigan and in architecture school, there weren't a lot of jobs in architecture when I got out. So I branched into interiors. And so hence the background of doing both the interiors and the architecture uh, started pretty early in my career. And I have worked in Virginia, Chicago, Detroit, and once I got out here, um, I really realized I was pretty much in thrall with the Native American communities and the architecture that was going on here and just felt there was a lot of storytelling um, that I could participate in. And I really view architecture as a different vocabulary. It's really just a different language for me in terms of being able to tell tell a story. So I'm really terrible at Spanish, English. Lingu English is pretty good. Spanish, German, not so good, but I'm pretty good at the architecture language. And so that's really the language that I use. Awesome. That's a great story. Awesome. Jenny? Um, so I've been in Santa Fe, I think, 28 years. I'm born in Dallas, two doors down from Peter Windorf, but now Stockdale, one of our docents. So that's really exciting how that's come full circle. Um, so my family, my parents are from Dallas, I'm from Dallas, and the owners of the hotel before us were the Ballins, who were from Dallas. And so they knew me when I was born growing up. And so when uh, I went to undergrad and law school in Dallas and got out and started practicing business law and then decided I didn't want to live in a place that I had to get on a plane to vacation at, so, uh, and Dallas is beautiful, but it's flat and hot and not a lot of mountains and stuff. So, uh, I called the Ballins. We had been coming out to Santa Fe at La Fonda for years to visit them after they moved out here in 68. And so, I called and said, I'm interested in moving to Santa Fe. They helped me uh, interview with legal law firms here. And so I got a job. I lived with them while I took the New Mexico bar. So I'm licensed in Texas and New Mexico. And so I immediately started practicing law here, doing business law. So I did, uh, La Fonda was one of my first clients. And so I practiced law and did a lot of things like that, very close to the balance. And then, um, how, do you, how much detail do you have? They want to hear as much right. as you want to get. So, well, so any of y'all that knew the balance, this is, you will appreciate this. So uh, Ethel died nine years ago, and about that time, before that, Sam had been trying, he has five daughters, I'm kind of in the middle of the ages of his daughters, and he had been trying to get various daughters engaged and involved with the hotel so that they could take over uh, at some point. And for various reasons, none of that worked. I was kind of the go-between between the daughters and him because he was not always the most communicative with them, but he was with me. And um, so anyway, we never could quite get, none of the daughters were living here at the time and they all had different lives and husbands and all of that. And so then Sam asked me if I would be interested in taking over for him. And I said, absolutely not, no desire. 
no hotel interest. I'm a business lawyer. At that time, my husband, who was then my boyfriend, was living in Arizona, and I said, I've got other things I want to do. And so, uh, thank you, but no thank you, but let's continue to talk, and if and I get bored or whatever, we, I can do that. And so, Ethel died. Sam died a year and one day after Ethel died, mm -hmm. which tells you something about their synergy. Mm -hmm. And when Sam passed away, the daughters and the board came to me and said, oh, Sam told us you were going to take over when you died. <laughs> so here I am, eight, eight years later. So when Sam passed away, I became chairman of the board, which was his position, and inherited staff and hotel. And it's, I must say it's very different running a hotel from being here on site than being the lawyer, you know, that just got called in with issues and problems. So my learning curve was pretty, pretty, pretty darn steep. Um, so I've been here eight years, and so any of y'all that know Sam and Ethel can appreciate that story because he was quite a character. So. And I will say the best thing Sam did for me, which was not particularly having me run the hotel, was introducing me to Barbara. And I've said that to everybody, and I'll say that again. Um, Barbara had been introduced to the hotel uh, through Sam in his last year mm -hmm. and had started kind of consulting, hadn't done any big projects. Uh, I think Sam was tired, and I think there was, uh, you know, it takes a lot of energy to take on big projects at the hotel. So they had been in discussions with it. And so when I took over, you know, I was told, oh, we have an architect. So Barbara and I met each other, and it was like, you know, two dancers feeling each other out. I was like, oh, boy, you know, how is this going to work? And she was doing the same right. with me. And I would say by the end of the coffee or the lunch, it was, I was like, that was the best thing Sam ever did for me. So we've really been lucky to have inherited a female architect who's young, who's talented, and who is, she's been great not only with the architecture and the design, but she now knows our staff and our team and helps knowing, you know, when we do this, it's like poking a hole in a balloon and something goes out here, you know, what this poke is going to do. And so, Barbara, we've been, we've had fun, we enjoy each other, and it's the best thing Sam did for me. So. Great. It's true. That's awesome. I That's will say in show. terms of the being young, we're pretty close to the same age. So that was really, <laughs> that was very nice. That was very nice. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let me go through, I'm going to go through some of the questions that have been submitted by the group, just to kind of help facilitate this. And um, I'm going to throw some out to Jenny, some to Barbara, and some out to both of you, if that's okay. Sure. So one of the first questions is, I'm sure each of you has a part of La Fonda that's your favorite. And so I'd really like to know, Barbara, since you were very instrumental in the architecture, what part of La Fonda is your favorite and why? You know, it kind of changes, actually. Um, and I think it, it kind of changes on the projects that I do. Um, and it's interesting because somebody asked me this question earlier this week before your questions came out. And I don't know that this is a part, but it's the daylight. It's the fact that we were able to get daylight back into the hotel. So the daylight in the lobby, the daylight down here at the corner, the fact that we've been able to brighten the windows on the outside, it's all of that piece. Um, so I'm not sure that's that one yeah. specific thing, but I love that the hotel is lighter and brighter and feels better. Well, you think about Santa Fe is all about the light in right. so many ways. And so that's, that's really a great insight. Jenny. I would say I have two favorite parts of the hotel. When I first got here, my favorite part, which I'm still intrigued about, is everything below us. The entire basement, which we have the employee cafeteria, we have the old Harvey Room girls' showers, we have uh, the laundry, we have storage. I was just fascinated with, it's just a cubby hole of, it's a, you know, like an ant hive down there. So that, I love going down there, and I, it's fascinating. But my heart, favorite part of the hotel is my office, which is in the corner overlooking the plaza. And it's not because it's my office, but it's because it was Sam's office. So I have almost 30 years of remembering sitting at his desk and interacting with him. And 
So that office, I think, is my, will always be my favorite part of the Sam world. Spirit still lives there. Yeah. Yeah, that's awesome. Okay, um, next question is, and Jenny, maybe this would be more for you. Who is your most memorable guest? And I know you have a couple boyfriends, and why? <laughs> uh, I, I say my, I'm not sure memorable, my favorite guest, and I will tell, is a couple named Sid and Ruth Schultz. Sid and Ruth Schultz are in their 90s. Uh, they are, uh, he was a, uh, a bone doctor in Albuquerque. He's just recently retired several years ago. Uh, Ruth was one of the ones that started Swaya with India Market with Sam. And she's just got these amazing stories about that we literally gave him a broom closet here at LaFonda, and that's how Swaya, which is the organization that puts on India Market now, and uh, Ruth is an expert in Native American jewelry. She's judged every year. She's taught me more about Native American culture, Native American jewelry, um, and they're just kind of like parents to me, and I would have never met them, but for they stay in our hotel every Indian market for 50 years, wow. same room, you know, so we can't change anything. Um, <laughs> And you may see, I should have brought a picture. Sid wears Indian Market pants, which are these crazy plaid, I mean, see them across the plaza, Indian Market pants, and we actually had them in one of our ads last year. Um, and he has promised to will the Indian Market pants to La Fonda when he passes away. So <laughs> it's just, you know, they are just fascinating. They are bright. They are. Uh, they are as young as my friends are when you talk to them. To just be that engaged in life and about to have that kind of knowledge and history about Santa Fe and Indian arts is just fascinating to me. So they're fabulous. And we should have them if y'all are interested. That's a good idea. I know they would. Ruth would love. Oh, yeah. They would love to come speak to you guys and talk about. They're really nice. Uh, you know, they do a lot of. Uh, Ruth lectures a lot on how to start a collection, what to look for, and, and they would love to come talk to you guys. If That's a answered. great idea. Great. All right, we'll add that to the list. That's awesome. Okay. Barbara, if you could go back to an earlier era of the hotel, when would it be? Hmm. Well, I'm going to guess the obvious one would be the Coulter era. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but it's probably not the only one. So. The, the Coulter era is, I don't know if it's because my mom was a jeweler and my dad was an engineer, so I always kind of had that small to large scale and that need to solve problems. Um, I don't know if it's because I did interiors and then I did architecture, so I've always looked at things from both sides. And, I, you know, architects, I think female architects say this, you know, I, I've never understood, I, I love being an architect. But I've never understood why you stop at the exterior of the building and you let somebody else do the makeup. I mean, I don't understand that. <laughs> and clearly, interiors is a lot more than makeup, but it's really where you get all that touchy-feely and tactile. And I'm a kinesthetic learner, and so I brought that into architecture for me. So Coulter and Meme are both such strong, tactile architects and designers. It's been really great to plug into that. And I, you know, in looking back at what I've been doing, I was doing that long before I knew about Coulter and mm -hmm. Meme. And lots of people said, what are you doing? And that doesn't make sense. And, you know, you should be over here. And we'd like to hire you, but you have too much interiors. We'd like to hire you, but you have too much architecture. We'd like to hire you, but you don't have enough interior. You know, so I never fit in that right box. And so it's been fun following in Coulter and studying Coulter to see somebody 100 years ago who managed to work all that out. On a side note, because I worked in Chicago for a little while, the 1949 portion of the building over here on Water Street was done by an architecture firm, um, which I think was in existence a very short time period, but it branched out into a lot of different ones. And it's Root and Burgi and, oh good lord, I forgot the last name. Holabird and Root and Burgi. And there's an and in between all of those on the drawings. In Holabird, Root, and Burgi, and Holabird and Root, and Root and Burgi are some of the most well-known architects in Chicago. I mean, famous, much more famous than 
John Gaw meme. So if you go anywhere east of the Mississippi and you say Holabird or Root or Burgee, everybody goes, wow, really? <laughs> and you come west of here and everybody says, who? What? <laughs> and what I think is so interesting about that portion of the building, particularly when you go on the outside, so I anticipate all of you are going to do this, go walk outside on Water Street and look up at those fifth floor balconies. Because if you look at them in a flat plane, so you look directly onto them, they're perfect little corbels and they're perfect little beams and then there's vigas sticking out, right? Those projecting vigas. But if you look up underneath, they clearly didn't understand what any of that was because there are skinny little corbels that would make no sense and no respecting New Mexico architect would ever do. But it's because they really just didn't understand. So it was this big Chicago firm who looked at pictures and said, oh, we can do that. <laughs> didn't quite get it right. So I love that part of the hotel as well. You know, so while we're on the topic of um, Mary Jane Coulter and John Gaumine, who was the, was one a designer or was the other an architect or did they do both? I, I, for me, they did both. And um, Coulter was at least 20 years older, at least around 20 years older than John Gaumine. And so the reality is that time there weren't licensed architects. So you went to architecture school, you became an architect, you did design. So, I mean, even Frank Lloyd Wright, uh, ironically, was not a licensed architect. So mm -hmm. part of it was just the era. And so Meme was a licensed architect. Coulter signed her letters with designer and architect. Hmm. So for me, she's always been both. Great. Jenny, do you have a favorite era of the hotel? If you could go back to any era? Not as interesting as Barbara's. Okay. okay. <laughs> Perfect. But I have a question I think you can answer. How many pieces of artwork are in the hotel collection? Well, I guess uh, to dodge it a little bit, I guess it depends on what you consider artwork. Mm. Um, if you consider what we insure in our, uh, as artwork, I would say maybe 420 pieces give or take, but we have a lot of things that we don't ensure that are artwork, like the Ronan Beck tiles, like the rabbit uh, sculptures up in the terrace. Uh, so we have a whole lot of things that I would consider artwork that aren't, wouldn't be part of that. But I, so when I'm saying the 420, I would say pieces of art on the wall, sculpture, or, you know, those are the things that we ensure so that if something got damaged, but uh, I don't know how you could count, yeah. you know, it, kind of everywhere you turn is a piece of art. Yeah, so. really, the whole hotel is. Well, and to add to that, I, you know, all the tin mirrors in the corridors, right. is it artwork mm -hmm. or right. is it a mirror? Right. Yeah, I mean, it's not insured as artwork. Right. The headboards that are hanging in the, is it artwork, is it a mirror? I, you know, the blanket boxes. So right. I would say there's a lot more than You're that. Right. Right. <laughs> Do you have a favorite piece of art, Jenny? Do I? One oh, favorite? You can't oh, I know that. that. I know. I know. I know. That's a hard question. Um, <laughs> maybe give you. Maybe just yeah, give me your yes. top no, three. No, I would say I do. And you know, I'm just yeah. And it's Tony Abeda's, and it's not the big, beautiful, expensive mural here. Um, it's the one that he painted at the parking garage. And the yeah. reason I love it is um, so we had a flat surface, and Barbara and I talked, what do we do with it? And we had this great idea to do kind of what IAIA across the street has done, is every Indian market, we would have an Indian market artist paint it, and then next year we'd have somebody else paint it, and so we could kind of have an evolving piece there. Well, that was great until Tony came and decided <laughs> to paint La Fonda, and I fell in love with it. And then I was like, I don't, no one's painting over that one. <laughs> so I, the reason I love it is we watched him paint it. Um, we didn't tell him what to paint. We didn't, you know, and to have him take the exterior of La Fonda and put it into his style, um, at any rate, I just, it's so special because it's a mural and it will be there forever. forever. Yeah. And so, so I would have to say that's it. Barbara, what about you? Um, or maybe pick your top three if you can't pick one. <laughs> well, I, so from the current 
contemporary era, it would be the Nakona Burgess up on the fifth floor of the, I think it's the Apache Indian standing. Yeah. Um, from the older era, it's hands down absolutely the Shalako on the other side of this fireplace. And um, I think in, I don't think, in part, it's in, in large part, it's because I've been fortunate enough to have clients in Zuni, and so I've actually been fortunate enough to design Shalako, a Shalako house, and so got to go from the design of the house to the bread, bed, bread baking, to the turkey making, to for hundreds of people, to the dance, to the hanging. So that has really special meaning to me. Awesome, that's awesome. So here's kind of a fun question. Are there any believable ghost stories at La Fonda? You know, you hear? Me that? Well, yeah. either the one. black and white lawyer that doesn't really believe Right. <laughs> Oops. Um, I, I can't answer that. The, what I will answer is that our uh, chef concierge, Steve Wimmer, who's recently uh, retired, he swears, I mean, he will tell you his ghost stories and he swears by them, but what's odd is he can, people have, guests have come to him over the years and described the same image the same figure in the same location. Now these are different guests over a period of years. That kind of gives me goosebumps to think about because how, how can that be? Um, these images and the descriptions aren't on the internet. They're not part of our webs. I mean, it's not out there. And so how would, so uh, that's all I'll say. Mm, that's, uh, that I, gave me the chills. Uh, it did, I mean, it's, and you know, uh, hopefully Steve, Steve. Um, yeah, I, uh, let me, we should have Steve come talk to you about the, um, and, and there's some stories to that, because it's a theme, anyway, we should have Steve come, come address it and talk to you guys, because again, he's had this by various guests over decades, so it's not the same person, so that's a little weird, but he's got details. We'll do that. Okay. I think he's on our list, okay. so we'll definitely do that. A um, couple more. All right, so let's go on to some more questions. This is kind of an interesting one. What surprises first-time guests about La Fonda? What do you think surprises first-time guests? How difficult it is to get around the building. <laughs> and it's so much better. I, I do. I think... And that's probably not just a La Fonda, that's a Santa Fe. I mean, we've all stood in the plaza and we've watched people who are clearly not from here do this. It's all brown. <laughs> and it's all this. And, <laughs> and the street, well, how do you say that? And then they come in and when it was, the building was darker and um, there was so much artwork and posters, and I don't know, you know, I'm assuming all of you have been here and been coming to the hotel for a long time. Prior to the renovation, I, there were over 700 posters on the wall. There was a lot of visual chaos, and so it just was hard to find your way around. And so you've come to a beautiful, strange place, and you've come now to a beautiful, strange building, and people were just baffled how to get around. Jenny, what about you? Any thoughts on that? Well, the comment I get is totally different from Barbara's, which is, it's so busy. I mean, with people, you know, the restaurant, the bar, you know, that they've gone to other hotels and stuff, and it's, it's not as busy. I think that's what the comment I get, namely, of surprise by people. Yeah. By guests. Yeah, I hear that a lot, too. Yeah. People think it's really busy. Which is good for us making payroll every two weeks. <laughs> So if there was one, because we have a wonderful representation of all of our docents here, if there was one key message that you want to communicate to the guests during our, to our tours, what would that be? Jenny, you want to start with that one? Yeah, I think the biggest key message that I would like the uh, tour goers is how unique La Fonda is. It's really unique. Not only is it locally owned, it's not a chain, just the, the rich history, and um, we are a great ethical employer. Um, you know, I, 
by and large, the staff is happy. We have great benefits for our staff. I mean, I could go on and on, but La Fonda is really unique. And in my peers in the hotel industry, you know, that own chains of hotels, um, you know, that are more cookie cutter, I think La Fonda, the more and more I'm in the industry, the more and more unusual that I see La Fonda is in, on so many levels. So if there's some way to convey that other than the art and the history, because that clearly is unique, but it's, it's kind of the whole package of this place from the uh, staff on up to the physical hotel is just unique in all the world. It really is. That's a good answer. Thanks. So I'm going to give you the hard, all the harder questions that are to start out, and then I'm going to go to the easy ones. Are they so, true false? Are they true false? Multiple choice? <laughs> Probably. Some are a couple. Um, this is a really interesting one I like. If you were to overhear a conversation anywhere in the hotel, what would you hope to hear? This could be any era. This could be any, this could be today. It could be 20 years ago. It could be whatever. Barbara, you've got some interesting history. Hmm. I would, I think one of the things that Neem and Coulter did and that Jenny has supported me in doing is that ongoing sense of curiosity. So I hope that people come into the hotel and they come through the first door and they look around and they say, huh, what's that big thing on the fireplace? And then they get to the fireplace and then they say, wow, look at there's that really great wrought iron on the stair. What's there? Huh, look, now I can see what's happening down there and there's these weird paintings on, around the doors. And so I think for me it's really about curiosity to keep going into the hotel. And, and building on that, I really hope that people keep coming back because every time they come they see something else. Mm -hmm. Jenny, do you want to add anything to that? Well, um, the reality is, so I have a private bathroom in my wonderful office, which I never use. I use every public bathroom here because I hear more conversations in the girls' room than I could anywhere. And so I, that's one of the reasons I do that. And I hear, the, fun, the one I hear most of the time is the one uh, down the hall by San Francisco Street, First off, nobody can figure out our cool, cool, environmentally perfect Dyson hand, hand dryers. <laughs> trying to figure that out. They're all trying to figure that out. And then I hear a lot of comments uh, about the tile in that bathroom, because it's that blue and yellow, just busy tile. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, I rarely, surprisingly, hear negative. Mm -hmm. So it's mainly people, you know, did you see this or did you go to that store? And I learn more from the women's bathroom than I could anywhere in the hotel. <laughs> That's true. I, I think the men could go into the men's restroom and probably get similar. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to pause for a minute just to, this is a commercial break. Um, just real quick, commercial break. Please remember that we are recording this, and so if you need to go, go around the sides if you need to use the restroom or if you need to um, get anything to drink, okay? All right, commercial break is over. <laughs> so he can pick up and when he does his editing. All right, next question. Um, there are some framed photos by Edward Curtis next to the concierge desk. Are they original prints or are they copies of his prints? I'm taking this one because <laughs> I actually researched this for whoever asked the question because I wanted to make sure that it was right. So and I have pages of info. So let me try to boil it down for you. So first off, the expert in town on Curtis's, and these are photo reviewers, is Bob Capone, who owns the Rainbow Man across the street. Uh, the other original Curtis expert is Richard Lampert at Zaplin Lampert Gallery. So what we have, per Richard, are photo reviewers. Um, so Curtis, made glass plates of them. Most of those glass plates have been destroyed, damaged, lost. There are very few original glass plates left. Um, Richard bought, in 1972, 2,000 of the Curtis copper plates. And the photogravures are made from those copper plates. 
And um, so they're either a platinum or silver photo printed from the glass plate, and those are all considered original Curtis's. Um, so for hours, Curtis hired an engraver, and he transferred the image from the glass plate to the copper plate, and then had the pieces we have made from those copper plates. So, you know, I was pushing, are they original? They are as original as you can get for photo reviewers. Uh, Richard said that there's the tome for Curtis is called the North American Indian, and it's a 20 volume collection. And ours are uh, in those texts by Teddy Roosevelt. I mean, this is a major uh, piece of art from history. And ours are from those volumes, from the New Mexico volumes. So as Richard said, those are, ours are the real deal. So they're called photo reviewers. Um, and if anybody's got more questions, I would either call Richard or call Bob Capoon at the Rainbow Man. I, I had heard differing things, so I'm really glad somebody asked that question so I could drill down and get an answer. That's great. Good. That'll help in our manual. Yeah. Really good information. Barbara. Yes. If you could redo anything, I feel like I'm in jeopardy. If you could <laughs> <laughs> redo anything that was done during the 2011-2013 renovations, what would it be other than to save time and money? And I know we saved. Oh, a lot I wouldn't of time. do that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Jane. <laughs> okay, I might do that a little bit. Um, wow, that's a that's an excellent question. You can pass to. Uh, no, to I'm not going to pass. I. I'm not sure I would have changed this, but I think it would have been really interesting. So outside the new family restroom up on the fifth floor outside the bell tower, there's that little strip of concrete floor with the wood edging around it. I, all of you are kind of, yes, maybe. So originally what the hotel had, um, and it still exists in the corridors, is the cent there's down the center strip of the corridors plain concrete, and then there's a little wood edging piece, and then there's colored concrete on the outside, and that's because there would have been a carpet runner down the center. I personally would have loved to have seen that carpet runner there, and then the colored concrete stay at the edge. Maintenance-wise, that's a disaster. You're now <laughs> mopping the you know, concrete, you're vacuuming the carpet. I mean, it's just a mess. So that was the one little nod that we kind of left up on the fifth floor. So there's that historical remnant that I'm guessing most people don't know what that is. And they kind of look at it and say, what's the deal with the wood <laughs> in the corridor? But I love that we were able to expose that one little piece of it. That's cool. Jenny, anything that you would add? Well, I mean, the renovation in Barbara's job was, um, I mean, amazing. The one thing I would do, which was an impossibility, is um, we have, how many bathrooms were raised? Oh, there's probably like 18. We may have 15 or 17 bathrooms that have a step up into it that are raised. And uh, we took all of the ones we could and made them yeah. uh, flush. But there were just certain conditions in the hotel that it was impossible. So if it hadn't been impossible, I would have taken all of those right. and made those flush. On a more m a minor detail, all of the corridor carpet that is so beautiful and vibrant, I would have made the colors darker because our housekeeping staff uh. is having a very hard time keeping it clean. Even though it's clean because it's that beautiful gold tone yellow, it's killing our housekeeping staff trying to keep it clean. And mm -hmm. you know, who knew? I mean, we looked at, we sampled it, we did everything, you know, so you do the best you can, but if I had to do that over again, I would have made that color darker so it wouldn't show mm -hmm. as much dirt. Yeah. I know that's pretty. I love that carpeting. Clean. I know, it's, it's so, so beautiful. beautiful. But talk to Mary Nuanas. Yeah, I know. has to clean it. I yeah. know. <laughs> yeah. It's true. Yeah. Barbara. 
So if you could tell us, can you tell us a little bit about the process in renovating the property and then any unique considerations and then also any surprises that came along that were just like, oh my God, what are we going to do now? So those are three separate questions. <laughs> they <Sure>. are. <laughs> you can make it into a whole paragraph. <laughs> so the process, unique, unique. and surprises. some surprises. Um, I'm going to start with an early story. So when Jenny first uh, came on board as the chairman of the board, chairwoman of the board, and we started working together, Sam had initially hired me to actually, and I'm sure you all remember this, fix the leaking skylight in the restaurant and take a look at upgrading the linens. That's what I was first hired for. <laughs> and um, so when Jenny came on board, she said, hmm, seems like we might have the cart before the horse and maybe we should take a look at some other things and see if there should be a bigger process to this. And so at that point I said, I'm gonna go down to the basement, which I also love, and I'm gonna look through the existing drawings and I'm gonna start doing research to see what we have. And the hotel had a, um, and you see this every right where, right? There's the fire maps to get out of the, mm -hmm. and any building anywhere, right? And it's little exit maps with here's little arrows to get out and whatnot. And so down in the office, there was the fire map. And over time, um, starting early on, you know, people had been adding. This is the original building, and then this got added in so much square footage, and then this got added in so much square footage. And, and then I'm looking at the drawings, which there is, the 1929 drawings, 1949 drawings, 1955 drawings, 19, I, you know, but there's not one drawing showing the whole building. So I said to Jenny, I think it would make sense if, and stay with me, girl, because this is going to be expensive. <laughs> <laughs> and it was. I think it, I think it would make sense before really anything happens to actually get as-built drawings of the hotel because we can kind of piece it together, but we really, there's some holes and I can't quite tell what's going on. And if we're looking at some bigger projects, that's the foundation, right, of how everything goes together. And so you did all that math and you added all that up in the hotel. I can tell this right. Sure. Believes that they had 190,000 square feet. That's how big they thought the hotel was. You're all laughing. So. We worked together to hire a firm to come in because this is a very complicated building. Got a bid. It's going to take them three months and 12 people kind of full time to go through and measure the outside, the inside, the rooms, the bath, the whole nine yards. Three months. They're not close oh, to not being even. done. Not close. <laughs> not and Jenny's like, this is the first project. This is a failure. What's going on? I'm like, I don't know. I can't tell. And, you know, there, and I'm on the, I mean, I'm over here every day. What's going on? We don't know. We can't tell. The building's 300,000 square feet. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> not even close. I mean, not even close. <laughs> So, and their fee went up exponentially. Correct. As, just to make that and the clear. and the time went out exponentially. You know, so I mean, right out of the bat, it was like, oh my god, whoa, oh my god, yeah. we had no idea. Wow. So that was a pretty big. That's uh -huh. a big. Uh huh. Yeah. <laughs> that it's pretty unique. <laughs> but it, but in terms of the process, that's where you start. You start with, you know, what do we have existing? Then we went through and. We took that information and we brought in a whole team. Um, it was myself, engineers, structural, mechanical, electrical, plumbing. We brought in code consultants. We brought in, in a separate interior designer. And then we went through the hotel, now that we had all the drawings, and we did a evaluation, basically a, a building assessment of is the wiring up to code? What's going on with the plumbing? What's happening with the steps? What's happening with accessibility? And so we basically did an assessment and ended up with two big binders of information that then kind of set the priority for here's code issues, here's nice to have issues, here's if we had all the money in the world issues. And then we sat down with Jenny and her team and talked about, okay, now what do we do? So imagine a quarter million dollar in fees. Imagine talking to my owners and say, we need to spend this money. Well, what do we get from that? You'll get two books. And well, what will the guests see? How can, 
they won't see anything. This is just getting us the data we need. I mean, right. so we, that's the base level we had to start with, which was a real challenge. Wow. Right. Yeah. Right. But before that, we had nothing. So, yeah, I, you know, it was really <laughs> hard to try to make, look at the hotel holistically. When I came in um, and it rained, there were buckets in the lobby. Okay, I'm like, I am not gonna run a any organization that when it rains you put buckets out in the lobby. I, this is not gonna happen. So you know, Barbara was thinking, well, you know, maybe Sam, maybe we can just patch. And the good thing is, Barbara and I, if we're gonna undertake something, we're gonna fix it right the first time. And that's why I said, hold your horses. You know, you're gonna just band aid this so we don't have buckets in the lobby. That's really not the problem. At that point, there was a cloth over the um, skylight that had 10 years worth of dirt on it. Mm, it's just, right. you know, it just, there was a lot more going on than buckets in the lobby. And so that's where, that was, that was the starting. But if it hadn't been for our relationship right. and our trust and me having a background as a real estate lawyer, so I understood plans, I understood process, there was no way I was going to get our owners to pay for that because most owners want to see a return, you know, or have the guest experience be improved. And this was just getting the baseline. So, right. And that took the first year. Pretty much, yeah. yeah. And they, it was interesting. This just So they put, the way they do it is they put these little orange glow dots where, and then they laser shoot it. So for months, we had you know, thousands. thousands of dollars. Thousands. So the guests were like, what the hell? And then the guests would go thinking they're helping us take them down. So, I mean, it was, it was, it, it was, it was an experience. It was an experience. Was an experience. <laughs> that was a fun six months. That's a good one. Those are good. So I am going to talk about another fun thing, uh -huh. though, that we found. So um, since I, you've all seen the historic photos, there was a fountain in the restaurant. And so when the restaurant was enclosed in the 70s, the fountain, or that courtyard was enclosed in the 70s for the restaurant, the fountain was removed in order to make more space. And I don't know how many of you remember, there were lots and lots of ramps because the, that platform or the restaurant itself was eight to 10 inches below the surrounding corridors. And if you walk out there and look, you can see that was always meant to be an outside space and all of those white painted doors with the, you know, painted glass, those are storm windows. So if you look at the sides, you can see where the rope edging is that they would have nailed in place. And so the intention is those would have been brought out in the spring, you know, and the whole place would have been open. But if you look at the corridor floors around the restaurant, you can see they're all sloped because it rain would have come in and then come down. So that was a little tricky in terms of getting the floor to be level because the corridor floors were not level. Um, but once we agreed to put the fountain back in, when, and, and you know, we could tell from the old drawings where the fountain was and roughly what the size of the fountain was. And so it was like, okay, hopefully there's a drain there, but doubtful. But when we pulled out the hole, um, dug into the, the old flagstone, what we found was the old fountain tile. They just imploded it. And, kept and it. I mean, it was all broken, and I mean, there wasn't anything that was usable, wow. but it was pretty great to see that old tile. So that was pretty fun. Cool. Since we're talking about La Plazuela, mm -hmm. so one of the questions is, the La Plazuela windows were allegedly the inspiration of Mary Jane Coulter, and her friend Olive Rush. And then it says, do you know who painted the original wi windows and how many were there? So I am gonna interrupt for a second. So this is, I'm answering your earlier question of what would I like you all to tell people when you come through? <laughs> her name is Mary Elizabeth Jane Coulter. There we go. <laughs> Don't forget the Elizabeth, it's not Mary Jane. And everything she signed is M-E-J Coulter. So she definitely, I mean, who knows what she went by, but I figure the woman didn't get a lot of love for a lot of years. She should be Mary Elizabeth Jane Coulter. Absolutely. Um, and her, so Mary, Mary Jane Elizabeth Coulter. Mary Elizabeth, Mary Jane. Mary Elizabeth Jane Coulter and her friend Olive Rush. Do you know who painted the original windows and how many were there? So what the, the documentation that um, I've been able to find is that 
there were windows painted in the New Mexico room, which clearly behind here is the New Mexico room. This is not the size or the shape of the original New Mexico room. So it's changed considerably. Even though it's always been roughly in the same location, it's changed considerably. And there used to be windows on that opposite side of the wall. And so what I think happened is those are the windows that she painted. Oh. And okay. there was, and there, in theory, if there's a window left, it's actually still in the New Mexico room and it's around the corner um, where the Paul Lance is on the long wall and we actually have lit it behind. It's clearly been repainted and I think the only reason that window is still there if it's hers and we've had experts come in and they can't verify it um, is because on the kitchen side they've drywalled it. So I think it just got forgotten. So the La Plazuela windows are not Olive Rush, they are not Coulter. Never were. Never were. Those were painted in the 80s by Ernesto Martinez. So not historic. And what's so interesting is when we did the restaurant, I think probably the largest complaint we had, hands down, were people writing in, how dare we change the folk artist windows? How dare we change the historic windows? What were we thinking? Well, we were thinking they weren't historic, and Ernesto was still there, and he was painting the replacement pieces. So we still had the original artist. <laughs> so we're thinking we were good. Well, that leads me to the next question. So he was the original artist for those windows, mm -hmm. and then did he paint them on site? Mm -hmm. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, I, yeah, pretty much. He had a studio down in the basement. Mm -hmm. okay. That's cool. Of course, of right? Course. Of course, he did. Right, right. A big, a nice studio down in the basement. So, and he did a lot of the oil paintings down there. Really? Yeah. Oh, he had a whole studio, framing, canvas paints. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And, and is he it sold. And he sold out of this his studio at. That, <laughs> <laughs> he did. Did he donate any of the proceeds or? No. <laughs> <laughs> so is it Ernest or is it Ernesto, or is it both? I call him Ernest. His son calls him Ernest, but he, you know, he I, goes. Well, but in he signs things, Ernest. So I don't know where the Ernesto hmm. came from. Somebody tried to make it kind of sexy, probably. Yeah. Okay. And so, you know, we could have him come talk yes. if y'all would. We'll, we'll talk to him. Um, we'll, we'll see if we can get him in. So, cause, okay. That'd be good, too. This was an interesting question, and especially as I was uh, starting to look through um, folk art, because I saw that there was some actual culture uh, going and you are dressed for folk art market tonight already. and jenny is dressed for it so the question was there are two important examples of northern new mexico arts and crafts that are missing the real culture and straw applique Does, do either of you know is there a reason for that is that, that a general actually, question yeah it's kind of like you know more you know based on what your knowledge of culture and your knowledge of these things why have they kind of gone away so i just actually um I saw Fran Levine this week, who is the ex-museum director um, at the History Museum, and she and I were talking about colcha. So colcha is a specific embroidery stitch, and um, there are, nope, and, and you can tell because, sorry, <laughs> this is not colcha because typically on the back side, colcha looks exactly like the front side. I mean, it's really stunningly beautiful. Uh, what Fran and I were talking about is, there, it was kind of specific to northern New Mexico. Um, there are not a lot of people who are doing it anymore, in part because the guilds, uh, you had to have X number of generations of experience in order to get into the guild. Mm -hmm. And so as people have died off, the guilds died off. And so there are still some people um, who are doing the culture, because I think last year or two years ago at the Hispanic market, right, it was a woman who won for the culture. Um, and they're slowly letting in some Anglos and some different people to do the culture, but it's a struggle. And the, the, I don't know anything about the straw, but that's what I know about the culture. Okay. Are you talking about culture today, that we don't have any in the hotel today? No, just I think, I think there's just the, the art of some of the photos back in the day of culture looked like that there were culture pillows. Right. Yeah. So there were, there was back in the day culture, and I would suspect Absolutely. 
the reason there's not today is one, the cost. Secondly, y'all would probably be surprised at how many pillows go walking without mm. culture on it. Um, so, I mean, to some extent, it's impractical in modern day hotels to have that kind of valuable piece in the room because unfortunately a lot of people think because they've rented the room that they own the room. So I suspect that's why. And some do. It's not, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. But, but Barbara, I mean, one of the things we did um, is kind of as a nod to culture, like some of the, uh, the New Mexico History Museum, the licensed fabric in La Plazuela, the little animal prints, you know, that, that evokes culture kind of patterns. And Barbara, very specifically, we picked things that would uh, not mimic it, because we're not trying to copy or imitate it, but evoke what the culture patterns and the, the design was. Right. Right. Okay. And, and so culture, uh, you know, is folk art, and it's, it's definitely more whimsical. And so there's kind of quirky little animals, and there's quirky little you know, uh, flowers and different kinds of things. And so we looked at culture pattern books, actually, and Jenny's right. We, we sometimes we took those and we used them as stencils on pieces. Um, obviously, where in the rooms where we have the drapery, we did flowers. I mean, those were embroidered in India. It's not culture, but it's certainly a nod to culture. So, I, I, you know, this kind of goes back to that thing of that curiosity. I clearly... I'm not a seamstress, and I'm not going to sit and embroider and learn culture, but I hope that other people come to the hotel and they look at all of that and they say, gosh, I'm intrigued and I want to know more, and hopefully that spurs something, because it's such a great thing about northern New Mexico. Yeah, it's really beautiful. Um, next question. And this is kind of going more in the uh, realm of the artwork, so maybe, Jenny, you could start with this one. Is there a strategic plan for the acquisition of the art or commission, or is it tactically done on a catch-as-can catch -can basis? I wish I could say I had the strategic plan for the art, but that would be total fabrication. Um, I'm not sure it's catch-as-catch-can. Um, what I have done is tried to continue the collection kind of that the balance had started, which is clearly they were in, interested in Native American art. Uh, as was uh, Gamim and Coulter back in the day. Um, but I, one of the things I try to do is go to a lot of the galas for the nonprofits, whether it's SWAI or IAIA or the Cancer Foundation or whatever. And so if I am able to buy art that I think fits into the hotel and, still, and benefits one of our nonprofits, that's really the driving force in me making decisions on the art because I'm trying to support our community, the nonprofit community, because there's so many phenomenal nonprofits here. And these artists that are donating their pieces to it, to me, that's the most supportive we can be. So I would say it's more done in that vein mm -hmm. versus, well, we don't have uh, enough Mateo Romero, or we don't have any Terry Graves, or, you know, as opposed to going out after specific artists. I would give my right arm for Preston Singletary, but we, I can't afford it, the hotel can't afford it. You know, the glass, the, the very expensive glass things, it's, again, it's hard in a hotel because then you're gonna have to secure it. You're gonna have to keep people's paws off it. And, you know, one of the things Barbara and I, you know, like is the kinetic, you know, you wanna touch and feel the, the tile and the, you know, it's a kinetic, the, the railings, the hand forged stuff. So I've kind of, avoided the things that are too precious that you know you're going to have to put up in a glass case um, so to the extent that strategy i guess that's about what it is for me. well that, that's good because that actually answered two questions which was criteria so it's always been kind of interesting to me in terms of the artwork nobody seems to damage it nobody seems to touch oh, it that's not true. so <laughs> so that was my next question so, so that was a good question just to that's tell, not true. You tell everybody so when you buy a, a piece of art in a campus you hang it in your house you don't think about it well when we buy art we have to have plywood put inside the frame against it because we have had whether it's vandalism or carts or whatever, we have had slashes in the art. 
and Ooh. so poking or elbowing. Yeah. So to avoid that, we then every piece we get now, we put plywood back it so at least if somebody is going to hurt it, it's not going to go clear through the canvas. We had uh, a beautiful piece outside the uh, La Terraza elevator on the fifth floor of the Native American chiefs, and somebody got lipstick and put mustache <gasps> on. So the nice thing is we have a lot of curators and art restorers here in Santa Fe, so that hasn't been an issue at all of getting it restored. Um, but it, we wow. do have art damage. So, and that's, that makes me you know, very sad. For me, that doesn't mean we don't keep collecting. You just do the best you can and know that if, uh, like when Tony painted the mural outside, I hate to even say it and jinx it, but I'm like, that's going to get tagged. You know, LaFonda gets tagged with graffiti all the time. I said, Tony, and he said, Jenny, I'll come fix it for you. What are you worried about? So, and especially with our current artists, the things we had, I don't know if y'all know Melissa Malero, Barbara and I met her and bought some of her paintings um, for the rooms, and one of hers got damaged and stabbed, and she, she was fabulous. She sent us one to hang while she took the other one back and repaired it. Now, we ended up buying the one she sent us. Tana. Smart. <laughs> yeah, but, you know, so, you know, everybody's been really great about it, but we definitely have it's it's uh -huh. we try to protect it as much as we can yeah it's what's reasonable well, speaking about acquisition of art which is always a good thing to think about especially coming up on folk art um is the display space in the hotel at a at a have we maxed it out is there more oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> no. No, um. and do we rotate it it's not maxed out, but one of the things Barbara and I definitely talked about and decided when we took these 700 posters down, that one of the things, the, the, one of the issues with the posters weren't that the posters weren't lovely, but they were next to $100,000 oil paintings, and so it was really hard for a novice to tell what was valuable, what wasn't valuable, and we really felt like we had two too valuable of an art collection to just scatter it like it was. And, um, you know, the reason we had 700 posters is, you know, back in the day when Sam and Ethel bought the hotel, there wasn't a whole lot of money. They were trying, the hotel was about to be torn down mm -hmm. in 68. It was in horrible condition. And they didn't have a ton of money to go fix everything. And so as they, you know, the do you remember all the O'Keefe posters with the opera and all that that was so big in the 70s and 80s? You know, that was easy and expensive art to buy and frame. And so they did that a lot. And then over the years, and I still get gifted posters signed by the artist. I have an entire art portfolio in my office of all the gifts I've been given because people are very generous to La Fonda. Mm -hmm. But Barbara and I made the decision we did not want posters. You know, that was, right. we took um, kind of the best of the collection and we reframed them and some of them are down in the basement and in the hotel, but not in our, what we consider the main part of the hotel. And we are both dedicated to not, um, I would use the word tchotchkeing the hotel up again. Because, again, if we can't do something right, we're, we don't want to do it. So we're not going to Band-Aid mm -hmm. art just to have a wall filled. If we don't have a really phenomenal piece, it's going to stay plain and blank. Um, and we and, know where the blank walls are. Yes. The one, <laughs> we know what we're filling. <laughs> I, I have had, I can't tell you how many artists that have come and approached me, uh, in, La, in the Cantonita, in between the bar in the French pastry shop, mm -hmm. we have a buffet, and over it is this big old white wall. And I, I have had more artists. Oh, Jenny, I have the perfect piece, and here it is. And Barbara and I actually we have the perfect we piece. We have the perfect piece <laughs> that we're working on. So you know, we definitely have blank spaces that we still want to acquire. But until we find the right piece of the right circumstance, we're not putting things up just to put them up. So there's been a couple of questions by some of the docents on the tours. Um, Sam's favorite piece, which is rumored to be the one in La Fiesta. Ford Ruthings? 
Is it so? Can you? Um, that Probably four. The one with, same. I think it's the one with the, the buxom couple. woman. The couple? <laughs> yes, I and think that's so. The Ford Riesling. The, knowing Sam, that was, I, I never talked to him about his favorite art, and I, that was probably more Ethel. I think Ethel was probably more involved with collecting art than Sam okay. was. It wasn't, uh, I don't think, as important to Sam. But that piece would have reflected Sam. <laughs> okay, good. So forgive me if I butcher some of these names, um, but did Ernest Martinez consult with Fred Cabote on the interpretation of Nimbre's art in the Lumpkins Ballroom? I don't have I any idea. I doubt it. I doubt it. Well, we can ask Ernest that. I doubt it. I, um, I doubt it, too. And Fred Cabote, I'm not sure he was a Nimbrous. Okay. I mean... I'm not sure that would have made I don't know who connection. asked that particular question. Um, did you have a, a reason for, I mean, did you have some gossipy uh, piece that was going there that you should tell us? So that I would say, as to speaking to him, right. I'm not sure. But there is no question because we've seen, I mean, in going through Ernest's um, studio, he absolutely was copying things. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So. And um, he might have used his book. He, oh, he may I really have, yeah. Oh, that's good. Uh, my vague memory tells me that Ethel worked very closely with him on doing those shields in the ballroom and telling him what animals, what figures. I, I think if anybody pulled that out, I would probably say it was Ethel directing Ernest. But we, we, we can talk to Ernest and you'll get Ernest's side of it. We can't get Ethel's side anymore. But I'm pretty sure Ethel was pretty involved in that. Um, is there any feedback from the guests on any particular pieces of art that you continually here. Is there one or two favorites out there? I wouldn't have that data. <laughs> um, no, because I think everyone's got their own taste in there. You know, I yeah. hear differing. Some people just are floored by the Cassidy. Somebody went over, was at the art museum, a guest, and the art museum said, go over to La Fonda. They, you know, we ain't got nothing compared to La Fonda. So she was fascinated with Cassidy's. Then I have other people that are Marla Allison fans, you know, younger, contemporary. So I think it just depends on taste, because yeah. I hear differing, you know, differing favorites. Yeah, I have a favorite. I, I love, What's your I, favorite? I love the dragon outside my office, a dragonfly outside my uh, office. Sheldon Harvey. I love that yeah. one. Yep. That particular one, though. There's something about that one I'm really attracted to. Um, Jenny, do you have a favorite guest room? I have two favorites. One of them is the new 401, and correct me if I'm it's because the way it's situated on this side, it ends up with a window on the side, and it's a deluxe, so it's got windows overlooking Loretto, but it's also got an extra window, and I'm all about white, so I love that room. Um, but my real all-time favorite room is 501, which is the suite up by the Bell Tower kitchen. Um, just the, the, the balcony. The balcony is amazing. Uh, and just the whole suite. It just reminds me of culture for some reason. I, I don't know if it's the size or the photos we have from that room. But well, and the angle, too, the way it overlooks the plaza. And just, mm -hmm. yeah, I, I love that room, too. Yeah. Barbara, how about you? I also have two. Uh, I like room 458 which is the old manager's mm -hmm. apartment. Um, and so when we got to that room, literally it was the manager's apartment. So there was a living room, a kitchen with a little dining area, and three uh, separate bedrooms. And so we converted that into two individual guest rooms and then a suite. And so I, it's got lovely wood ceiling. I mean, it's just a really lovely, and it's on the west side of the building. And then my other room actually is 214, 
which is um, over on the south side. And it's because it was actually one of the model rooms. And so it was the first room that we got to go in and do something on. So this is a little bit about the, the process. The first thing we did was actually pick a room in the um, 1949 portion of the hotel and a room in the 1929 portion of the hotel. And we, they're called model rooms. You go through and you do the renovation in those two rooms so you can understand what the issues are, what the problems are, buy furniture so you can understand how the furniture is going to work, have staff sit in it, guests sit in it. It's, it's your test room. It's your model room, kick the tire room. And we had so many issues. <laughs> and so to see that room go from a place where um, the 1929 portion of the hotel has uh, concrete superstructure, so beams and columns, and then pentile, which does everybody in the room know what pentile is? Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's pretty straightforward. We hate pentile, but it's pretty straightforward. I mean, you put a nail in it and the pentile shatters, and that's a, but we know that. <laughs> the 1949 portion has a concrete superstructure, so beams and columns, and then it had this thing called gypcrete. Anyone? It's not gypcrete. I just renamed it. No, but it was pyrobar. It's pyrobar. It's pyrobar. Anyone heard of pyrobar? Uh -uh. Pyrobar is this teeny three inch wide, three inch wide, three inch wide, and it's like 12 by 12. Styrofoam. Compressed gypsum block. <laughs> With. Uh, holes in it so you can run conduit and whatnot. It's compressed gypsum. Did I say that? Uh. So when we got into that portion of the hotel and started doing stuff, it just went like this. And the walls went. <laughs> so to start with that and get to a place where it's this finished, beautiful room with the you know, end grain mesquite where we built up the pieces. I, I just love that story. And the other thing that I really love about that room as well is um, one of the ideas we had was to work with uh, Native American artists and actually do canvas floor coverings. And so um, this is pretty common. It's been done hundreds and hundreds of years all over the place. You know, it was a way to take inexpensive floors and make them look expensive. You painted a canvas to have it look like stone or wood or whatever you were doing. And so in that room, we actually hired an artist to paint a canvas floor covering Native American. And it's stunningly beautiful, and we could never get the numbers to work. And so it's the only room that has that floor two covering. 214, that is? Mm -hmm. <laughs> two, two, two 14. 14. That's awesome. That's a great story. It's 212 or 214. Oh, one of the two? Yeah. Okay. So I, do you all know when we did our renovation, we put a time-lapse camera in one of the rooms from beginning to end of the project? Have you all seen that? And it's, oh. it's the manager's apartment. Right. So we, we should, it's 10 minutes? Not even. Not even? It's fat. I mean, so you can watch from beginning to end. So we should... We, yeah, that's a fun thing. We should have bring that. Okay, up, maybe upload that to the new website. Yeah. That'd be yeah, kind of yeah. fun. Yeah. yeah. And have it or show it here in one of our talks. That'd be yeah. fun. There is a question here about Willard Clark. Did he actually do the woodcut for the Indian Detour sign by the concierge desk, or did he just design it? We've had a lot of questions about that. The wood. The Did he actually carve the sign? I, short of us actually doing a wood test to see when the wood, what well, I don't, yeah. I've not ever heard that. Yeah. I've not <laughs> even heard that as a rumor, so I don't know. Okay. Again, if you all have information, because we're getting information too. <laughs> Good. Yeah, my gut would be he designed it and didn't carve it, but. Okay. Yeah, no. Okay, well maybe that's a good project then for the team. Um, this is a fun question, and I always like these kinds of questions. If you could have dinner, and this one I'll go to Jenny first, with any two deceased people who were involved in La Fonda history, who would they be and what would you ask? Oh, well, one wow. is very easy, Sam Ballin. 
What were you thinking <laughs> with me? I mean, really, I, I've said that a lot. <laughs> um, you know, because I told you my story that he, I'm here because he told people I was going to do this. So I would love to sit down and have a comment. What were you thinking? What were you expecting? What did you want to happen? How do you think it's unfolded? What do you think about it? I would love to have a sit down with Sam Ballin. And I've had many just conversations, so I would love to have them answered. Um, the second one is kind of probably an obvious one. I would say it would be John Gamin, just because, you know, Barbara and I have read a lot of the correspondence between he and Coulter, and uh, I, I just think he would be fascinating to talk to dealing with an older woman and an architect and you know, because I'm friends with his daughter and grandson, I, I'd just love to meet him and talk to him about the Fonda. Well, I've seen these. Barbara has these books that are this thick with the correspondence and research and the amount of work that you've done to research the hotel has been incredible. What about you? You know, all that research. Is there anybody that you would? I, I want would to talk actually to? like to talk to Herman Schweitzer. Yeah. <laughs> who um, I'm not sure he had anything to do with La Fonda specifically, but he was the buyer for the Harvey Company who was doing all the jewelry and the pottery buying and whatnot. And so you often hear him a lot with the Alvarado Hotel down in Albuquerque. And there's correspondence in the meme files between Schweitzer and Coulter. So I'd really like to sit down and talk with him. Um, Ironically, it would not be Coulter or me. Oh, really? No, I'd like to sit down with Fred Harvey. Oh, wow. <laughs> I'd, re I'd love to sit down with him because yeah. he did so few hotels that were not, I'm going to say this backwards, not on the tracks, right? He did trackside hotels, and La Fonda's a non-trackside hotel. So, and he mostly did new hotels, so the logic of, why did you pick Santa Fe? Why did you pick, you have to get people from Lamy to Santa Fe and then in a car from Santa Fe? I mean, talk about a lot of hurdles to make that happen. Those would be the two people for oh, me. That's good. Those are good questions. Well, speaking of Woodman. <laughs> well, the other, the second Harvey, so. Ford. Hard, Ford, yeah. So at Los Poblanos in Albuquerque, the ceiling fixtures commissioned by Jean Gamin in the ballroom are attributed to an Albuquerque tinsmith in the 1930s named Woodman. Could these fixtures also date from the meme renovation at La Fonda and be by Woodman? Do you know? I have not heard of Woodman, so I don't know. Do you know who asked that question? Well, that was the second question. Okay. You know, it's so, this is the tricky thing is, uh, you know, Coulter clearly had access from Chicago to Los Angeles, and so she was pulling stuff all along the train line. You know, people kind of forget that, but she was pulling stuff all along the train line, and then stuff from Europe. And Meme clearly had some people that he was pulling stuff from, but La Fonda was his first commercial project. So he was 38, she was 58. She'd been doing projects since 1904, up and down the line. So I don't know. It, we've been able to track some stuff. I mean, she writes about it more than he does. She writes about people. He doesn't write about people so much. So it's hard to say if Meme would have brought them or Coulter would have brought them. And, you know, one of my favorite pieces of correspondence is Coulter's writing and saying, hey, you know, since you're going to be over at the so-and-so, can you take some photographs or do some sketches because I'm doing something at the Grand Canyon and I can't quite get this look right. So there was clearly a lot of stuff back and forth. I don't know. Do you, what's his first name? Okay. 
Right. 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 It could be. Sure. Do you guys know what year the shops were added on the San Francisco side, and were they always shops? I know there was a restaurant over there, but it, can you expound on that a little bit? <laughs> <laughs> that was the sad sigh from That's both of us. Did you hear that? Yeah. <laughs> First up, I don't think they were all added at once. Okay. I think they were some added later than others. Um, but I don't know what year the first one would have been. It's, it's So this is the difficult piece about the shops in, in particular, I think. Um, all we have, all the hotel has, is the meme drawings. And meme in 1926, when he drew the drawings, um, copied, thank God, traced portions of the Rap Rap and Hendrickson drawings from the corner, but not the full corner. So we can't really tell what was in the full corner. And so from photographs, you can tell that there's shops on that corner, mm -hmm. um, but we don't have any drawing evidence to really show what's going on there or what was a shop or not shop. And so, you know, in the meme drawings, a lot of this, um, on Old Santa Fe Trail is Harvey rooms. It's the Harvey Girl rooms, which was down in the basement, which are now the shops. Um, and then, again, clearly there was something. The 1949 uh, Cantonita, when that came in, clearly that was a courtyard. And so that was an intention to make that more retail space, right, to bring stuff in. I, you know, what I've heard, and I can't even tell you where I've heard this, and maybe it was from you or maybe I'm making it up, is really when Sam came on board, um, the hotel was not making money. They were trying to band-aid stuff together, and the best way he could make use was to actually get retail out onto the perimeter. So my gut is that the retail on San Francisco came in when the balance bought the property. And I don't know when or how, and you know, everybody looks at the French pastry shop and says that's so old, it's, you know, it's been there forever, and, and you know, you talk to the French man. pastry people and they say, oh, I remember putting the windows in in the 70s. Okay, so, I, you know, so there's lots of difference, there's a nostalgia. The building is owned by everybody, but not really. <laughs> but it sounds like ownership, ownership <laughs> which is right. great. So we have 180 rooms now, rooms and suites. How many rooms were there at the max? So again, this is the impossible question. Okay. And I say this because there's the drawings from the wrap corner that were missing. And then when the meme corner came in, um, rooms got reshuffled and so we can see where some of them got reshuffled and then uh, somewhere along the line other rooms got reshuffled because we can see that in old which you probably have seen some of these there's like the old um, menus and there's the old things that would have gone out to guests we can see stuff is moved but we don't have any proof or documentation of when that happened mm -hmm. You know, I've got the 1949 drawings. It's very clear how many rooms were in there, and now there's less rooms and more rooms. So I can't, there's no hmm. clear answer. Okay, okay. There's some interesting questions here about La Pazuela that I think are kind of fun. Um, both Miranda, and I'm gonna butcher this name, Mes, Mes, Miranda Levy, and I don't, can't, who can pronounce the middle name? Who can put this question in? Miranda, M-A-S-O-C-C-O, -C -C -O, Levy? Oh, this one just didn't have the R. Okay. Miranda and Judge Lewis Sutton both had tables and predate the enclosure of La Pazuela, 1976. Where were those tables? And did they use those tables in the winter? And, or did they move into La Fiesta? Or what did they do? I can't answer that. I'm wondering if maybe I, we could ask Jonathan, one of the sons, and see if they know. That would probably be the best way. Um, and I don't know the first person's name, but clearly know all the Suttons. So let me, I'll see if I can get them in and see if they can answer that. Because I That'd don't have any other knowledge. Are there any other famous tables that, that were always in La Pazuela that people would That's gather? I've Sam, always heard. Yeah, Sam has two coffee. Oppenheimer. Yeah. 
But I guess that wasn't Lafayette's waiver. No, that was the bar. So Oppenheimer and the whole Manhattan Project, mm -hmm. they were down in the bar. I mean, they talk on and on about the meetings that occurred in La Fonda. Yeah. Which is, yeah, you hear about that a lot. And mm -hmm. any others come to mind? Mm -hmm. Well, Judd Seth, heard of? I, for any of y'all remember Judd Seth, he had a table. So, and again, Laurel may be able to help us on who came, but I mean, they, we've had legal tables, I think, in the restaurant between Judd Sutton and Judd Seth, and um, it was really sweet. Um, forgotten Kevin's last name. He's now head of BIA, who was head of the dean of the law school um, until he got moved to DC. A couple of years ago, called me and said, I want to put a legal table together, and he had um, Jonathan Sutton, he had the Supreme Court, so we had we, he, he did lunches there for a while with some of the lawyers recreating the legal table at La Fonda That's the last fun. couple of years. And then he got promoted to DC, so. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Um, let's talk a little bit about the docent tours since we have all these docents in front of us. One of the questions was, you, you've now been on a tour, so obviously you have. I have. I have. And, oh. and Barbara's due. I am. <laughs> So how do you feel about the docent tours so far, and what do you like? Is there anything you'd like to see done differently? Well, I've only been on one, and mm -hmm. I would just like to take a second to thank Sue, who's here in the front. I'm trying to think, Ed, was it two years ago we had our first lunch? About, we had just finished the renovation, and Ed says, oh, this woman wants to talk to you about docent tours, and I had so much on my plate. I said, okay, love that. we'll have lunch. And you know, from that conversation, I just said, Sue, be patient with me and patient with us, because again, if we're gonna do this, we're going to do it right. It's gonna take a while, and thank you for being patient and having the program evolve and develop to be sitting here. This is fabulous. So the cool. tour I went on um, had our PR people from Dallas who didn't know, and one of them was a new person on the account, didn't know anything about La Fonda, had never been to Santa Fe. And so that was a great barometer, and she just walked away intrigued, couldn't believe it. And the other thing that was really, uh, I've forgotten the woman's name. I don't, Your dose was Lynn. No, it was Donna. Donna's here, good. So one of the things that we were all I guess amazed about is she was like an actress. <laughs> I mean, in terms of, you know, nobody wants to be lectured to, and she made it interesting in terms of modulating her tone, and she first off had the most beautiful jacket we were all totally jealous of. <laughs> she looked like a docent, but she was just so engaged and engaging that there was no way in an hour you were gonna be bored or you were gonna try to do something else. Mm -hmm. And I, so that was, cause y'all can tell I'm a talker, but I'm not a public speaker and I'm not, didn't near, don't have the charm. And it was just fabulous to have somebody that was just that engaging and you wanted to hear the next story. You wanted to go around the next corner and see what was gonna be covered. So it was, uh, at any rate, it was a dream come true that Sue started. So I really do appreciate everybody here because, you know, Barbara and I, you know, we know this much about La Fonda and you guys know this much about La Fonda. So, between, you know, we can help each other learn mm -hmm. and to try to share our knowledge and our love for La Fonda is, it, we just feel totally That's honored. Great. So, it yeah. was amazing, amazing. But and, and I think the mix of the stories with the facts and the art and the history and the architecture just really made it very special, very special. Barbara, in the docent tours, um, are there special things you would like to see mentioned? Anything that you'd like them to call out? Well, without being on, having been on a <laughs> tour. We have one hour. <laughs> I, my, my, um, impression from giving tours myself, because I also have been asked to give a number of tours, is you know, people like hearing about the art and they like hearing about the, the culture and the, the tactiles. People love the people stories. I mean, that's the stuff that really resonates. So I don't know that I want to hear more or less of it, but from my own experience, 
everybody wants to know those little gossipy pieces. So if we can help suss those out, that'd be pretty awesome. That's why this is so valuable, because it gives them a little, little stories behind the scenes stuff, which mm -hmm. is really great. So last weekend, Reba McIntyre was here twice. Twice. For meals. And then Not the favorite guest, though. Did you hear no, that? No, 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 no. <laughs> And then the mayor, Javier Gonzalez, was in yesterday, and he said, oh, Jenny, I brought Bill de Blasio in this weekend for lunch and stuff. I was like, great. You know, so that was just this past weekend. Mm -hmm. So those are fun. You never know who's going to show up, be in the house. So that's yeah. pretty interesting. Jenny, this is going to be a little bit of a challenging question, which, um, you know, is, is makes you think a little bit. So you talk about Sam Ballin, and you would say to him, what were you thinking 10 years from now? What do you see yourself doing 15 years from now? Who's, what's your succession plan? Oh, gosh. <laughs> no pressure. No. <laughs> Jane, guess what's coming down your no. pike? <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'll be right there with her. <laughs> well, clearly it's interesting because I didn't, this wasn't my life goal, so here I am. And then even after being chairman of the board, now buying the hotel, that was never the goal when I took over. So, you know, gosh, just first off, be careful what you hope for, because, or, you know, never say never, never say always, who knows? Um, I would say, you know, I naively thought being chairman of the board of La Fonda was what I saw chair Sam do as chairman of the board which is he came, now granted in that day, Sam was late 70s, early 80s. So he'd come have his two coffee groups. He'd come, you know, they traveled around the world. You know, he maybe came in and signed checks. You know, he would sit behind his great desk and people would come talk to him. So I kind of thought, this sounds pretty cool, huh? Right? And so, uh, reality for me has just not been like that. So, and part of that, Barbara, my husband, laugh, is my personality. You know, if I'm going to get into something, I'm going to get into something. So, if I could figure out how to be a Sam Ballin chairman of the board, I'd do this for another 25 years. I mean, who wouldn't? I mean, it, it's great. Um, so, if I could figure that out, which I haven't been able to do. Um, short of that, I, you know, I, I do love what I do. It's a challenge. You know, we've got 260-something employees, and uh, I'm pretty much here all day, every day. We have a general manager that runs all the operations, but because of my legal background, if things start going south, I, you know, they come to me, and I deal with our bankers and our accountants and our architects and our contractors. I deal with kind of the strategic stuff, not the day-to-day. -day. And, uh, you know, this is a changing, evolving business, and it's very competitive. And so you've got you to gotta be on it. And if, you know, if you let it off for one second, you're, we're going to get eaten alive. And I am... You know, you go over to Europe and you see the buildings that have been there for centuries and you see, you know, their icons. And here in the United States, it's just less so. You know, people tear things down, they improve by rebuilding. And, you know, I really would love to be the steward of La Fonda. I can't be, but for another 90 years, you know. So if, you know, to the extent I can play a part in that in making this a lasting culture and environment and still in, in, you know, upgrading and improving it and still being competitive in the marketplace. And let me tell you, it's hard. You know, we're up against marketing departments that the rock resorts and the big companies mm -hmm. that have more marketing and advertising money than you can shake a stick at. And we're one hotel. So mm -hmm. it's a challenge. So I guess that's not really answering the question. If I could figure out a better balance so I wasn't if, if I could be a Sam balance CEO and mm -hmm. I say that in all due respect I mean he he figured it out and he did it right and he had a fabulous life and I would love to walk off in the sunset like he does oh, now whether my personality will let me do that I don't know <laughs> that's a good that's a good response 
Um, one of the questions also asked was, in the next five, 10 years, what major changes in the hotel do you expect? Um, any, you know, are you wanting to do more improvements? <laughs> and I know there's um, always a di desire to upgrade things and, you know, keep things current and. So I would say for sure, yeah, we've got uh, plans and desires to uh, upgrade. Um, I would say probably the bar was a, is an obvious one. I would say the lobby, um, which may not be so obvious to everyone that's so beloved by it, but if you look at the pictures of the lobby from the 20s and the lobby today, it's very different. And Barbara and I are kind of on a mission to try to get the hotel back to the original, gracious, beautiful bones from the 20s. And so we could, the lobby could use some of that. Um, if I could wave my magic wand, I would take the parking garage down and rebuild it because those darn columns yeah. just jump out at everybody. Um, <laughs> but I don't think that's going to happen. So, yeah. you, know, I, you know, I think we, we do have some renovation projects Barbara and I are okay. working on through the hotel. Um, but again, we've got to continue to, uh, to keep the rooms current mm -hmm. and to keep, keep pace with new developments. And, you know, I don't think that's ever going to stop. Do you have no, no. Oh, no. And if you look at, you know, Drury's new, you know, Asanasi is doing their rooms. You know, El Dorado just did their rooms. Hilton just did. I mean, it's, as Jenny said, it's an incredibly competitive Ongoing project. project. Yeah. So I, I, the, the trick... And the great thing about La Fonda is it has so much history. So that's its boon and its baggage, mm -hmm. both. Um, because at some point, because there is so much ownership from the community and from people who come, it, you know, there really is this, don't change it, don't touch it, you know, but it's a hotel, it's not a museum. So at some point it actually has to keep growing. And that's what successful buildings do, is they keep grow, growing and they keep moving and shifting things around a little bit to meet and today's needs. Current. So we have about 10 more minutes. So what I'd like to do is just open it up to some questions about history, art, um, architecture, and I'm gonna turn this off. Mm -hmm. So what we can tell from the original 1929 drawings, because this is the meme and Coulter piece with the colored concrete floors, is those were once outdoor balconies. And it's unclear, I mean truly unclear when those became enclosed balconies, um, but that's why they have the vigas in the ceiling. And um, this goes to that stepping up and stepping down. In some of the rooms, you had to step up over a threshold, and some you have to step down into a room. And so um, by using that end grain block, we could cut that into different thicknesses to make up whatever needed to happen based on whatever was going on. So those used to be outdoor balconies. No, and again, this is the hard piece because even in the meme drawings, we don't have the drawings that showed what was here first and what he was demolishing. 
So it's hard because I, I also have heard there's a sta there was a stable and there was something on this side. You know, there's pictures clearly that show the Chevrolet store over on that side. And you know, anyone in this part of town, when you buy real estate, you have to get that phase one, which is the environmental. And everybody says there were car things everywhere all over here. So I wish we knew, but I don't. Okay. Yeah. Well, clearly, yeah, the Loretto. So you think it was adjacent to the Loretto Chapel? No, um, it, was, it, it, it would be on the west side of the old Santa Fe Trail. Right. So it would be that building there across the Las Cosas now. Oh, okay. Other than me, pretty much living, breathing here. <laughs> uh, no, the last uh, person that lived here was Mickey Stewart, who was the general manager, and she lived in the manager's suite that is one of Barbara's favorite rooms. Um, before her, I don't remember, but yes, I mean, before, I'd say 30 years ago, there definitely were people that lived here. Lived here. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, uh, Mickey retired. I'm going to say 25 years ago, and she was the last person that lived. I mean, when I say lived here, I mean, that was her apartment. That's where she lived. I, I can I heard it so I can repeat it. Right. Framing for that hotel was it pen tile or something else? So it's a mix, and we know this because we have dug into the walls. So there is some concrete superstructure. There is brick piers, so brick columns and piers. Um, there is some pentile infra infill on the exterior walls. The interior walls are all wood framing, and the roof joists are all wood. It's a mess. <laughs> It has, it has everything. So this, is, this was part of the tricky part in the, in the renovation is we had 1949 drawings, 1929 drawings, 1980 drawings, 1990 drawings. We had sketches of what kind of was in that corner. So we didn't know until we got into that corner. And it's amazing from 1919, which is when that was built, to 1926, how different the construction in those two portions of the building are. And it's one of the challenges we have in doing these projects because, you know, Barbara draws beautiful plans and we have the consultants, the mechanical, electrical, I mean, everybody's doing the best they can and then we get it bid and we have a price and we tell our bank and we tell our owners this is what it's gonna cost and then you get into the wall and it's not at all what you think it's gonna be and you know, it's always more complicated and more expensive. So it's a real challenge to work on buildings this complicated and this much of a mix. And, you know, you would think in the eight years we've been doing this that we'd have it all figured out. And, it, you know, still, there's so many parts of this building we still haven't touched. So... Um, and and those, those wrap drawings, I mean, what's so amazing is how prolific they were. Also, I mean, there are buildings in Colorado Springs, Trinidad, Texas, New Mexico, and there's a lot of information on them and on, you know, there's some files that have older, 
zero on La Fonda. I mean, I have searched and searched and searched. So if any of you can find anything on the wrap drawings, great. Anybody else? Any other questions? Oh, we got one more over there. Can, you right, can I do another one? Yeah, stand up. <laughs> um, is there any relationship consulting, working with Alan Allfelt in the restoration in Las Vegas, or is that a other than just by the heart? <laughs> Barbara and I love Alan, and actually Sam took me to see Alan and Tina at. La Posada 20, the year they bought the hotel. Um, so Alan, yeah, I mean, we have a relationship mm -hmm. in terms of we both kind of work with family and for family and what the challenges are and with dealing with historic hotels. And we support Alan in anything he does and vice versa. And so uh, hopefully when he gets uh, the Castaneda redone, which is going to be a long process, right. I mean, he's not... He didn't do what we did, which is go to the bank, get a loan, and say, you know, we're coming in like steamrollers and getting it done quickly. You know, he's doing it as he can. So, but we would love to do a La Posada, La Fonda, Castaneda, do heart, you know, we definitely are going to do that. Um, I, I'm still flabbergasted. So he's got, in the hotel industry, it's occupancy rate. He's got one of the highest occupancy rates for any hotel for La Posada. And he does zero advertising or marketing, nothing. So, you know, clearly, you know, that's very popular. I think Castaneda is going to be more of a challenge um, because of the location. And, you know, it's not La Posada. Of course, Winslow's out in the middle of nowhere, too. But he smartly put in this phenomenal restaurant there. And it's worth going to, even yeah. if it wasn't for the hotel. But so, yeah, I think eventually we would love to try to do some tours and packages and try to help each other. And we're very, we're in touch a lot. Yeah. So very supportive of each other. Great. Barbara, Jenny, thank you. Thank you. Awesome job. <laughs>